I'm Patricia Van Skyke, and I'm director of the Lloyd Library and Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Restrooms, the Development, Design, and Dis Disinfection of the Bedroom and Sick Room in the American Home. Uh, in the days before the development of vaccines and antibiotics, when infectious diseases like tuberculosis, cholera, and typhoid were a constant threat, the American home was the final line of defense against potentially fatal illnesses. Sadly, with the outbreak of COVID-19, we found ourselves revisiting the questions, how do we stop disease from coming into our home? And once in, how do we stop it from spreading? The Lloyd Library, as many of you know, was founded by three pharmacists in the 19th century and were rich in collections related to medical history especially in the field of eclectic medicine, which we'll hear more about tonight. Those collections, along with works that we have here on hygiene, sanitation, and domesticity at the turn of the century, brought Elizabeth Yuka, a recipient of our 2023 Curtis Gates Lloyd Fellowship to the Lloyd Library. Um, it's been absolutely delightful to have her doing research here and on a daily basis, we hear little snippets about her finds. So I'm really excited to hear it all pulled together tonight. Elizabeth Yuko is an award-winning journalist, bioethicist, and expert on the intersection of science, medicine, and architecture. She has a PhD in ethics from Dublin City University and is currently an adjunct professor at Fordham University. As a journalist, she covers culture, health, and ethics through a wide range of lenses. I do encourage you to Google her or go to her website. You'll just be fascinated to see all the different angles that she um, visits these topics. So it's really my pleasure tonight to welcome Elizabeth Yuko. As Patricia mentioned, um, I have been here uh, at the Lloyd Library for the past month researching um, the intersection of health and American vernacular architecture, you know, the American home, um, looking specifically at bedrooms and sick rooms. And, um, whoops. So before we get into more specifics, a few caveats, limitations, and methodology to my work here. Uh, the first is that uh, there was a lot of material here to cram into four weeks. Um, I mean, I got a lot in, um, but I was not able to fully read every single piece of information written on germ theory that's housed in the library and a lot to cover in an, an hour talk. Um, the materials used in this presentation are almost exclusively sourced from the library here, as well as a few background uh, pieces of material that I that will be helpful in the beginning, just for some context. Uh, this is not an exhaustive lit review. Um, some of the medical practices and information that I will be sharing, um, we know is out of date. <laughs> and so... Um, I do not advocate everything I will be talking about. These are just what the consensus, or there was never really a consensus, nor is there now really, on the best way to stop the spread of infectious disease. Um, and I will be going not necessarily chronologically, but according to topic. And importantly, number six is that I have long COVID. I Got sick at the very end of March 2020. Uh, I live in Queens, New York, the place where everyone was dying um, in the hallways and outside. So I stayed home. And um, three years later, I still have symptoms, including several neurological ones. So I might have trouble uh, finding words, losing my place, forgetting how to use Zoom um, <laughs> as a few examples. So uh, bear with me. So while I should I, why does someone from New York come to the Lloyd Library and Museum? Hear the brothers saying, we love monographs, serials, and rare books. <laughs> um, well, there were a few reasons. So um, yes, as you mentioned, that's the, the fellowship that brought me here. Uh, and actually, Patricia mentioned all of this, the extensive collection of materials on the domestic science movement, sanitary science, 
household management and all these other books and journals that either the Eclectic Medical Institute or the Lloyd brothers accumulated over the years. And the timeline works out really well with the period of time that I work with because the Lloyd Library was founded in the 1870s, which coincided both with the height of the eclectic movement as well as uh, kind of the middle of the domestic science movement. And so a lot, there, there's just, it was a popular topic. And so I was very fortunate to benefit from that. And I think, especially the eclectic medicine collection here um, is relevant because if you're not familiar with the movement, it involved medical practitioners who, among other things, this is not an exhaustive history, but were pushing back to some of the more gruesome medical procedures at the time. So bloodletting, purging, leech leeches, uh, primitive surgeries, and using things like plant-based remedies, physical therapy, and sometimes some more uh, interesting instruments that may not have stood the test of time. Um, but the focus was on non-invasive therapies. And so using your home to protect you against the spread of infectious illness within your within your household fits within that. And so um, this that's why that kind of helped. And um, also just being in Cincinnati is a really great city for doing this type of research um, because of course, New York is a very old city and it shares a lot of characteristics with Cincinnati in terms of being a hub of manufacturing, having um, densely populated pockets of uh, neighborhoods and tenements, but a lot of the built environment here still exists. And it's not the case in New York, or if it is, it's changed so much that, you know, you don't really recognize it. So, um, I mean, plus you have all the soap manufacturing that happened here and we're talking about cleaning. So there's a lot of, and furniture manufacturing, especially hospital and sanitary furniture manufacturing. Even when I'm not here, I come across Cincinnati connections all the time. So uh, that's, that's always fun. And a saying that was used a lot by people involved with the sanitary movement was corpus sanum in domo sano, uh, a healthy body in a healthy house was their goal. So the general time period I will be talking about today uh, is around 1830, the 1830s through the 1930s. Um, there's you know time on both sides of that as well that um, people were writing about these topics, but this is kind of the meat of it. A few things were happening. We had the second industrial revolution bringing people into cities. Um, people had to deal with poor working conditions at work with factories. Um, you also had the standardization and mass production of goods in a way that we hadn't experienced before. And people were able to buy things more so than before. And also the growth of the media yeah. thanks to the mechanization of printing. So you had ideas spreading faster than before. Um, also with that urbanization between the great migration and immigration to the United States, this uh, cities continue to grow. And at the same time, uh, both private and public health um, was kind of at a crossroads. All of these conditions did not help public health at all, but it also was the impetus for public health and sanitation departments being formed and some of the laws that we take for granted being enacted. And so um, you had a lot of working class individuals living in overcrowded housing, often without adequate plumbing, um, access to water, poor sanitation. You also had several epidemics uh, happening, uh, a few cholera epidemics, tuberculosis was a constant presence. Uh, of course, uh, influenza 1918 to 1920. So a lot of a lot of things going on right now. So before antibiotics and vaccines, uh, our homes were our vital defense against infectious disease. 
Um, and the focus on hygiene and sanitation in the home and writing about it predates germ theory. And a lot of people think that all of this has to come after this, the discovery of germs. But first, germ theory is not a single moment. It was a long process of multiple people being involved in different countries and discovering things along the way. Um, so prior to that, the dominant theory as to how disease spread was the miasma theory, which basically was uh, the idea that these bad vapors, uh, poisonous gas, poisonous air, um, dirty air, was what made people sick. And that could come off of everything from um, horse waste in the street to privies, to other diseased people, to garbage dumps, to basically anything gross. Uh, and so that mm -hmm. is what people thought caused uh, disease. Um, and so this is from one of the books in the collection here that is talking about how malaria um, spreads by an almost invisible mist lying near the ground. Um, so, yeah. So this is not comprehensive, but as a quick overview, just to give some highlights of um, major developments in germ theory. I'm starting in 1832 with Henry Boyd, who was a local Cincinnati furniture maker. He was formerly enslaved, purchased his freedom, and um, we'll talk about him more a bit later. But in 1832, during one of the, I think it was the second worst cholera epidemic in terms of deaths, he suggested that cholera is waterborne, and he recommended that people boil water before drinking it. And um, yeah, people did not listen. They thought he was a little bit off. Um, and being a Black man, uh, even more so, did not listen to him. So uh, yes, then the next, the, the big name uh, starting now is Ignaz Zimmelweis, who was Hungarian, an obstetrician. He uh, noticed that in his hospital, there were two hospitals he worked at, one where the doctors wash their hands between doing autopsies and assist in uh, doing a childbirth, uh, and the other one where they did not wash their hands, or they one that did, one that didn't. And uh, turns out, when you have corpse germs on your hands and then deliver a baby, it's not great. Uh, a lot of it's yeah. I don't recommend it. He didn't either. Um, childbed fever uh, was rampant in his hospitals. A lot of people died. Um, people also dismissed him and he uh, ultimately spent the last few weeks of his life in a psychiatric hospital. Um, John Snow is probably one of the more famous names. British physician, he said that cholera is not transmitted by miasma. Um, and in 1950, 1854, uh, made his famous cholera map where he traced uh, all of the cholera deaths in one neighborhood in London to a single water pump. And so basically coming to a similar conclusion that Henry Boyd did before him, um, saying that we're getting sick because the water is contaminated. And it took longer to figure out what exactly was happening, but uh, it was a big moment. Then Louis Pasteur, most people have heard of, um, did experiments with food and came to the conclusion that invisible bacteria is what's causing infection and disease. Joseph Lister, a British surgeon, he decided it would be a good idea to introduce antiseptic processes before and during surgery, both disinfecting the instruments as well as the surgical wounds. And uh, as it turns out, that helps and fewer people die from sepsis and um, infections related to the wound. Uh, and then we'll end this little trip here with Robert Koch, a German physician and scientist who had been doing research on uh, bacteria and germs for, for years at this point, but uh, realized that different diseases are caused by different germs. So it's not just one universal germ that makes everybody sick. Um, so 
what's a good way of saying this? <laughs> In the past few years, we've had the opportunity as a people to um, receive new medical technology in the form of a vaccine. And it was not and is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to convince people of the benefit of something or the existence of something uh, like a pandemic. Um, and so a large amount of the actual work done to spread the ideas related to germ theory, of course, they were not using that language, but talking about um, you know, the need to uh, sanitize things, disinfect uh, the home and connecting cleaning and hygiene to health was left to women. And so you had books like When Plum Plumbers and Doctors or Household Sanitation. And um, uh, this book and others uh, argue that women were on a divinely appointed mission to guide the house, including in terms of their health, uh, the health of the occupants. And so she writes, showing that if women and plumbers do their whole sanitary duty, there will be comparatively little occasion for the services of doctors. So, um, but imagine <laughs> being tasked with convincing people that these tiny invisible little creatures exist. They're kind of like monsters, but not really. And they can make you sick. And we have to clean to get rid of them and wash our hands and take our boots off before we enter the house. And, you know, and that's, that's a tall order, really. Um, and so, yeah, and this is what we were, you know, this is how women were targeted at the time as well, you know, so you think we're smart enough to teach people about cleanliness and yet you're selling us a breast vacuum <laughs> and this guy here with his head in the board what's anyway um so yeah that's anyway so this also <laughs> fed into a period the same period which is sometimes also referred to as the sanitary craze and the use of the word craze or fad was intentional um, and that's because it was messaging that was coming primarily from women, and it was a way of belittling and patronizing this information, which to me reeks of hysteria and the crazy women who make things up. There was the assumption that it'll pass. Eventually, she won't care if you don't wash your hands before you eat and take a scoop of potatoes with your hands. I don't know. Um, but eventually the craze became widely accepted knowledge. Um, one of my favorite quotes about this period came from the New York Times. Um, and at this point it was speaking about it as an, uh, as a, an accepted uh, necessity of life. And they refer to the lust for sanitation that Americans had at that time. Um, and at the same time, you had various brands selling products that had various derivatives of the word sanitize, sanitary, hygienic, disinfection in the title. So Sanitas was a popular one that, that was used for several products, but uh, that's for wallpaper covering. Um, so the sanitary movement, like a lot of things from this time period in the progressive era are complicated because there were a lot of very well-meaning people who were trying to help people and, and improve their lives, but in the process may, well not may, did uh, intentionally uh, stigmatize certain groups of the population, marginalized populations. So um, when you had these usually white upper class or high, upper middle class women going into uh, places like OTR or the Lower East Side in New York, um, you had them going in and saying that we have to reform these people, these people, whether they were um, Black Americans, immigrants um, in other parts of the country, Indigenous people, they don't, they don't know hygiene, they don't know how to stay clean, and they're spreading disease, and we don't want them to continue to do that, but they're inherently dirty, so we need to teach them our ways and Americanize them. And so people got public baths 
which is good, but it also then introduces this idea to the public that we have yet to shake that immigrants are responsible for spreading disease and epidemics and people of color. And that's something that we also saw within the past three years. Um, so that's not great. Uh, hygiene classes were introduced in schools, especially in urban areas with the hopes that the children would, would learn proper hygiene and pass that along to their parents if they didn't know they didn't know better. Um, they also saw cleanliness as a moral issue, saying that tenements were death breeding, crime breeding hovels, and a problem for society to solve. Um, so, and this is from one of the uh, textbooks. This is from here in the Lloyd. Uh, keeping up the resistance of the body to disease germs and tells the story of um, like, you wouldn't kill your friends, but you know, if you go out when you're contagious, you are exposing them to germs that could kill them. Um, so this was, this is for children. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so where are women getting their information from? A lot of it, uh, comes from these domestic science or domestic economy manuals, household management books, domestic medicine books, and housekeeping manuals. Uh, women typically got these as wedding gifts or, um, you know, something special from their mother-in-law-to-be or their own mother, and um, had great titles like The Ladies' Parlor Book and Domestic Keepsake. Uh, what Women Should Know, a woman's book about women. <laughs> um, home doctoring, if the the black, the uh, vitology co uh, cover, uh, well, yeah, book cover looks familiar in the front. It's because it also was used by Pearl Jam as an album cover in the 90s. <laughs> so, yes. Um, so yeah, this is, this is where a lot of these, uh, a lot of people were getting the guidance about how to set up the bedrooms and sick rooms in their home. Um, also receipt books, which is something I learned about, whoops, hey, there we go. Uh, yes, receipts. Uh, during my time here at the Lloyd, uh, Betsy, who unfortunately is not here, she's, uh, one of the librarians here, uh, she was telling me about how, um, receipt books were essentially uh, recipes, but for folk medicines, herbal remedies, and they were handwritten or occasionally typed in these books that were compiled by the women in a family and passed down through the generations. And so these are a few receipt books that are here in the Lloyd collection. And that was a really, I don't know, holding these things that so many women over generations have held and turned to in times when they were panicking because their child was sick. It was, it was a, it was a very moving trip to the stacks. Um, so uh, yeah, that was, that's, that was a high, one of the highlights for me. So we'll start with sleeping rooms, which I'm putting uh, everything kind of lumped together, bedrooms, bed, space rooms. You see that spelled that way sometimes before things were more standardized. Chambers, fancy word for bedroom, uh, sleeping porches, um, sick rooms would also go into this category. So we'll start with some things that apply to any room that people sleep in. Um, but because I will always put a wet blanket on things, um, most household manuals, like the ones we just saw, were written for the middle class. Um, a notable exception being uh, Catherine Beecher's, uh, she started writing, her first domestic manual was 1841, which was the first of its kind written by an American for an American audience, because prior to that, uh, we just took the British ones. And um, so Catherine was unique in that she was the first American to do this and also included people who weren't rich in her guidance. So, but a lot of them were for, you know, middle class, upper middle class. Some of them even had chapters about what to do with your servants um, and how to train them properly. So, yeah, so the directions were for uh, people who had money and not every home had 
dedicated rooms for sleeping, multiple bedrooms, a bedroom with a window. Um, not every home had an actual bed and or multiple beds if there were several people. Um, and not every home had a bed that was shared by only one or two people. So just something to kind of keep in mind as we move ahead that a lot of what was written was geared towards people who had money. So people within the sanitary movement, domestic science movement, were primarily concerned about three things. Well, two things and then a lesser third thing. The first thing is that the air will make you sick while you're sleeping. This is for two reasons. The first is that people believed that night air was inherently unhealthy. And by breathing in the night air, it would make you sick or contribute to illness. And, um, you know, you don't know exactly what happens under uh, cover of night. And, you know, you had the night soilmen who were the ones who would go, you know, and, and collect what people dumped out of their chamber pots. Um, and so, yeah, there was this, when you're, when you're in a miasma mindset, night air is a little concerning. Um, people also believed that while you were sleeping, you exhaled carbonic acid. So um, essentially carbon dioxide, but they their math was a little bit off um, in terms of how much you produce each night and how much it takes to kill a person. And so essentially people thought that you could poison yourself in your sleep by breathing your own exhaled air. Um, so that's one concern. Another concern is that if the room is not clean enough, it will make you sick. So whether that is bad smells, that is dust. Um, once people started getting a handle on germs, they thought that dust was basically germs you could see. Um, and that dust, or that dirt and dust and filth contained specifically disease germs. So the bad kind. Um, and then a much lower down on the list and for people uh, uh, more of the upper classes was sleep quality. So going from not just having a place to set your head down for a few hours, but actually trying to be comfortable and trying to get restful sleep. So a lot, of, most of the solutions fall into a few categories, ventilation, sunlight, room placement, appropriate furniture and decor, and keeping it clean. And one of my favorite products that I've come across um, that kind of helps with several of these is zip-in fly screens made here in Cincinnati. Um, and this ad is maybe from one of the eclectic medical journals, or maybe it, it's from somewhere in the collection here. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, the screens to keep out the flies, because flies were also a huge concern because of spread, you know, the, them spreading disease. Um, there were whole books written about flies and keeping them out of your home. So uh, that's one example. So ventilation is top of the list in terms of how to make your bedroom, your home, your sick room healthier, because um, if there was enough uh, fresh air coming into the room, it was thought that it would reduce the carbonic acid in the room enough not to kill you. Um, so that was good. Um, whoops, go back. Uh, yes, the belief that uh, it was more common uh, or more, people are more susceptible to falling physically or mentally ill at night. So if you're going to get sick, it's going to happen at night and you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to feel crappy when you didn't the day before. And um, an article from the Eclectic Medical Journal says that you could wake up in a state of moral insanity. I don't even know what that entails, but I don't want that. Um, and so, of course, uh, the exchange of fresh air for bad air was also needed, needed to essentially clean the air so it wouldn't uh, get people sick. Um, and uh, eventually people started speaking out against the idea that night air was dirty. Uh, one of them being Florence Nightingale, who uh, 
wrote in 1861 that she believes that night air is cleaner than day air because you don't have as much pollution. You don't have horses going down the road, picking up dust. Uh, you don't have, um, what do you call it? Uh, other smells that, yes, yeah, so other smells and, and gases that come from everyday life. So she said that I was actually healthier. And in many of the books that I was reading here uh, at the library, they say the healthiest place to sleep is outside because that's the only way to guarantee that the exchange rate between your carbonic acid and the air you're breathing in is taken care of. And that's just, that's the safest. And so, um, I mean, a sleeping porch would be great. Uh, not everyone has one, um, but open air camping was also uh, suggested as a way to to breathe healthier at night. So um, that was another one. Uh, this is this was circulating a lot in the very beginning of the pandemic, um, including like national publications. But it is uh, uh, from the CDC archives from the Cincinnati Board of Health. I think this was on one of the trolleys. And the sign says, keep your bedroom windows open to prevent influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis. So um, this was, people were serious about this. Um, I forgot a picture there. Uh, sunlight, uh, people thought that by getting sunlight, it made you less likely to get sick. And so it had this strengthening power uh, also health giving properties was a term that was used in relation to sunlight frequently throughout, especially the eclectic medical literature. Um, also the restorative influence of sunlight and um, the moral influence of sunlight was something else. Uh, this particular author was making the argument that um, bad people come from dungeons and basements and, and dark prisons and that's where uh, immoral activities happen. And so let sunlight into your home. And so that one happened to your family. Um, and then eventually they also started catching on to the idea that sunlight would help clean the room during the daylight hours, which we now know the sun does have um, antiseptic properties. Sunlight does. Um, room placement was also important, both for sick rooms and bedrooms. If possible, the room should be on the second floor um away from the commotion happening in the rest of the household so it was nice and quiet it gave the sick person or sleeping person privacy and isolation and there's a, there's the idea that it kept you away from the street dirt and dust and ground level pollution and so um i th i think we don't think a lot about when horse and buggy were the main uh, mode of transportation. When the horses went to the bathroom on the street, that would dry up and turn into a powder. And so on dry days, when people, you know, when there was a cloud of dust covering everything, that was horse poop. And that's not great. Um, and so the, uh, that's kind of partially where the, if you're on the second floor, it'd be harder to get to you up there. Um, beds were a huge target. Um, and, uh, so this is a disease generator, according to the book that was the Pearl Jam cover. That was written in 1901 um, from, it's from the collections here as well. Um, and so what were the problems with beds? Uh, so we'll start with mattresses. Um, for a long time, the mattresses for people who could afford the higher end ones were filled with horsehair, cotton, or rags. Um, but for everybody else, they were filled with straw, hay, crop debris, leaves, whatever else you could find, corn cobs sometimes, whatever else you could find that might be somewhat soft. But of course, critters lived in there. It got moldy, damp. Uh, yeah, you understand. Not ideal. Um, Captain Beecher uh, tried to step in and <laughs> tell people that if they're going to sleep on a straw mattress, the most comfortable and healthful of the straws is oat straw, um, which is softer than wheat or rye. Um, I don't know the properties of the straws, so I can't speak to that. Um, but we started seeing the coil spring mattresses um, start to appear in the 1870s 
And by the early 20th century, they were being widely mass produced. So that became the norm. Um, a big innovation in beds came from Henry Boyd from earlier uh, here in Cincinnati, the Boyd bedstead. It was, uh, as you can see there, four posters made of wood and the bottom part had the grate of rope. So, you know, like a tic-tac-toe board with rope that had to be, on, on a normal bed, it had to be tightened all the time. It would frequently uh, go loose. You would fall into the middle of the bed. It wasn't great. So when someone said to sleep tight, they were hoping that your mattress was nice and tight and you rested well because you weren't in the middle of the bed with who knows how many other people. So Boyd's bedstead eliminated that by making it, making the rope stay tight for longer and um, being vermin proof. So uh, apparently the way that the bed was constructed, it did not leave little hidey holes for pests, which is good. Um, but by and large, his beds were made out of wood. And then by that time, he, I think he introduced the bed in 1836. So he had, a, I mean, bed, wooden beds were still used for a few more decades. But as we're getting to towards the end of the 1800s, uh, wooden beds became a target. Um, so the looseness of joints provided homes for vermin, uh, something that Boyd was able to avoid. Uh, wooden beds were porous, and so they had places to harbor disease, germs, dust, and dirt. Um, it made it very difficult to clean because of all these crevices, and they were heavy, and they were difficult to clean, uh, both to clean itself and then to clean around. So if you were trying to clean the whole room, it was hard to move. Um, and so this is hospital furniture, but just to give you an example of kind of the extreme version of what sanitary furniture looks like. Uh, metal, often white, uh, white enamel over metal, um, sometimes just plain brass or iron. Um, brass, iron, and steel, later steel, were the uh, metals of choice for uh, sanitary bedroom furniture because they were easy to wipe down. Um, casters were also key because that allowed you to move the furniture easily to clean. And this is from a local Cincinnati company who made a lot of hospital furniture. Um, and a few other uh, examples of ads for metal beds, including one that has adopted the sanitary uh, word derivation as its name. Uh, dust proof and vermin proof and easy to clean. Um, another thing that came up uh, in my research here and is something that I had encountered before is the idea of twin beds for people who are married. Um, one book said, well, I guess there were various reasons for this. And depending on which text you were reading, the uh, emphasis varied. So one would say that opportunity makes importunity. So the idea being that if a married couple is in the same bed, then that just makes it really easy to have relations. And I think I might be a little optimistic when I'm saying that's for consent purposes, but um, I mean, it, it helps, I guess, uh, you know, avoid unwanted uh, advances in that way. But also a lot of these books were very concerned about newly married couples having the passions and being so uh, into having sex with each other that they lose track of everything else in their life. And so <laughs> this was supposed to help with that um, by providing a barrier of a few inches and a separate bed. Um, so yeah, a more uh, I guess uh, a different aspect is the exposure to germs. And so you have a wife who's in charge of running a household, keeping everything up and running while her husband is out there in the public sphere at work and the bar saloons, maybe picking up germs and sharing a bed uh, increases her chance of getting sick. Um, and probably my favorite uh, <laughs> is, and a few of the books mentioned things like, 
Um, sleeping in separate beds will help the wife avoid smelling the husband's flatulence or bad morning breath. And in doing so, it keeps the mystery and romance alive in the marriage longer. Um, so that's that's that. And of course, when we talk about twin beds today, most people think of either I Love Lucy or the Dick Van Dyke show and you know the couples on TV who sleep in the separate beds. Um, and Hilary Hines, who wrote an entire book on the cultural history of twin beds, said that their appeal is that you're together, but also apart. Um, and today it's relevant because you see trend pieces. The New York Times has run trend pieces on this uh, since two, early 2000s. And another one just came out on having two primary bedrooms in a house or sleep divorces where you sleep apart from each other. So people have higher quality of sleep or having a snoring room. Mm -hmm. um, this is just, uh, we can skip over this. We talked about the sanitary bedroom furniture often made of metal, it's on casters. If it's wood, it is not Victorian wood. It is more uh, arts and crafts mission style wood furniture where it's just smooth um, and easier to clean and easier to move. Uh, sometimes it can resemble hospital furniture. And eventually in terms of architecture, there's a shift to more built in closets as opposed to wardrobes or armoires on casters that you, know, you moved around because you don't have to move closets, you just, you know, disappear into the wall. So, um, but that was not very common in older homes or if there were closets, they were very shallow because people usually haunt, there were you know, a bunch of hooks on the wall and clothes were hung because people didn't have that many clothes. Um, so sanitary bedroom furniture. Um, and this all ditto for sick rooms on all of this because obviously if you want to be healthy in your bedroom you want to be healthy in the sick room um although you're not going to have a married couple together in a sick room um i mean for many reasons but uh so walls and floors are something else that uh in order to have a healthy bedroom or sick room you have to pay attention to paint is healthier than wallpaper wallpaper can get damp at certain times wallpaper was colored with um an arsenic green or other things that weren't ideal. Um, although uh, in the 1930s, a Cincinnati uh, local created a substance to clean wallpaper. It did not take off as much as this, but it did as Play-Doh mm -hmm. uh, marketed towards kids. Um, so it's not ideal to have hardwood on the floor for the same reasons we discussed before, all nooks and crannies for the germs. Um, so oil cloth or linoleum, including a linoleum carpet or rug. So linoleum, but looks like a rug pattern, uh, was a popular choice. Wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpet, definitely not. Um, but it was acceptable to have an easy to clean rug. Okay, so getting more into the specifics of sick rooms. Uh, so we have kind of an evolution of the sick room over time. Um, the first being ancient methods, which is praying, then bleeding, uh, and using powerful drugs in the middle one, which is what, uh, eclectic medical practitioners were trying to avoid. And then here we are, the modern methods of healing the sick. Um, Virginia Woolf has a quote about, um, being ill and how, uh, things are said, truths are blurred out, which health conceals. And so when you are spending time in a sick room or you're ill yourself, uh, it causes you to look at things and think of things in a different perspective. Um, purposes of a sick room, because there are more than one. So the obvious one is isolating a sick person. So you stop the illness from spreading within your household, but also for the same reason. So it's, it's quiet for them. People were also placed in a sick room if they had an injury or a wound, let's say a broken leg with a wound on it. Um, so not necessarily contagious, but had a space to recover. Convalescence, which is something that we have forgotten about and pretend like is not a thing anymore. Um, this period between being actively sick or having you know, your acute illness and full recovery, now we think of, okay, well, I took my two weeks of antibiotics, I must be cured. Or I only had two sick days left this period. I took them, I guess I'm cured. Um, but 
the idea of convalescence was taking the time and the space you need to really allow your body to rest and to heal. Um, and that's when it hits very hard for me uh, with long COVID because um, it's, I mean, I, I couldn't convalesce for three years, of course, but, you know, it, it wasn't just uh, an immediate uh, two weeks and you're done, like everyone said. Uh, people with long-term illnesses or chronic illnesses also uh, were placed in sick rooms. Everything surrounding uh, pregnancy and childbirth. So if someone was on bed rest before giving birth, uh, the birth itself, and then any postpartum recovery she was permitted to have would have taken place there. And then end of life care and visitation um, also took place in a sick room. Depending on the culture, uh, there that may have been part of the death rituals in terms of people coming to visit before they move the person to the parlor downstairs or down the street. But um, so yes, lots of things happened in a sick room. But also will point out that having a separate sick room was and still is a privilege because not everyone lives in a home that has a room that they can dedicate to illness or if we're being more realistic now, kind of a, a swing room where you could use it as a home office, a guest room um, or a sick room. So uh, people did and still do have to make do without this space. Um, so some of the arrangements of a sick room, I could not perfectly recreate it here in front of you, but I tried. Um, so also what you find in, in any older medical literature is that there's very little agreement on things. So one book might say, you absolutely have to do this. And the next one will not mention it at all or say you shouldn't do it. Um, but the, I tried to do things that people by and large agreed on. So you want a pleasant view from the window. Um, which is something that has been the subject of studies in modern times. Um, a single bed made of metal, not pushed up against a wall, because you want to be able to make the bed, and if you're the nurse, go around the bed and tend to the patient from both sides and you know shift them if need be. Um, and when you're laying the room out, paying special attention to maximizing ventilation and airflow, including factoring in a fireplace if there is one. Um, ideally, you want a room with a lot of natural light. Um, no wallpaper, but light colored walls in cheerful colors are uh, recommended. That you want to minimize clutter, which I know is not great here, but this is a reflection of, of me, I guess because I am a cluttered person. Um, I, I paid attention to the second part, minimize clutter, but keep it interesting because you have this person in the bed for days, weeks, months at a time, they're gonna get bored. They wanna look at different things. Their, mark, their eye wants to explore. So if it's just white walls, they're gonna get bored very easily. Um, everything should be easy to move and to wipe clean. Um, minimize noise. So if you have squeaky doors, creaky floorboards, try to fix that. Um, another Cincinnati company, Red Cross Shoes, made noiseless shoes that um, were marketed towards nurses and hospital workers. The idea being the soles, I'm assuming, were made of rubber and made it easier to walk around and not disturb patients. Um, again, no wall to wall carpeting, but they did like one rug as someone was coming out of the bed. So that way their feet don't touch the cold ground first. Um, no perfume or fragrance to cover bad odors, um, but you can try to absorb them if you can. Um, and the only mentions of what to do if a house did not have a dedicated sick room was, I mean, other than trying to keep them as far away from family as possible, is to use a room divider. Common items in a sick room that you may also see in front of you. A large bedside table. This is where the person is going to be doing they're living, they're eating, they're washing, everything. Um, reading, you want to make sure they um, have space. Uh, the bed should be no higher than a sofa to make the person be able to uh, get in and out. Uh, you want a chamber pot or a commode, even if there is an official bathroom in the house, because you want to make it as easy as possible for the person to use the restroom. Uh, blankets should be made of wool, not cotton, because if the person sweats, the cotton is too hot and uh, doesn't help with the fever. 
Houseplants, not controversial. People, for the most part, agreed that houseplants are a nice way to bring some color and life into a sick room. However, flowers are controversial. And I think I came across a lot of material on flowers in sick rooms, which is something I had not really thought of that much, other than when my own mother was in the hospital and we weren't allowed to bring live flowers. Um, but I hadn't thought of it in a historical context, but being the Lloyd Library with lots of plant things, um, some argued that uh, the plants are, are going to cheer you up. They're going to bring life. People, it'll make people happy. Other people, <laughs> meant, this is not funny, but kind of it is, that <laughs> when you put a bouquet of flowers, you're basically watching them die. <laughs> and so from the moment you cut it and put it in, you're basically bringing something into the sick, room, sick, sick person's room that they watch expire in front of their very eyes, which does not really uh, boost morale. Um, also, there were certain flowers uh, that had smells that are too strong, thought to be too strong for sick people. There is so much detail on this, um, but uh, I didn't have a chance to get into it that much. Um, basic supplies on hand, a kettle, uh, water, a slop bucket, towels, um, broom, different uh, cloths, uh, ideally on the on the windows, thin white curtains, so there is some shade and privacy, but nothing, no heavy drapery that can trap the disease germs. Um, and you want books or other diversions to help pass the time, but nothing too exciting. There was an article in one of the eclectic medical journals, a uh, case study about a man who had typhoid um, and read Charles Dickens novels while he was ill. And he ended up getting typhoid three times in a row because he did not learn his lesson. And those Dickens novels made his mind so excited <laughs> that he was never able to rest. And so it's, you know, it's a fine line between keeping yourself entertained and becoming mentally exhausted thanks to Charles Dickens. Um, so, but the other things like knitting or, you know, uh, needlepoint were recommended. Um, something I appreciated about the eclectic medical uh, practitioner approach to sick rooms is that they took loneliness and mental health into consideration. Um, when, you know, basically saying that when you're isolated for a long period of time and you're only seeing maybe one family member or a nurse or possibly nobody, um, it's not, it, it wears on you mentally. Um, and, uh, as someone who spent a very long time alone in a 400 square foot studio apartment in New York, uh, while ill and convalescing, I very much appreciate that because it does mess with your mind. Um, and this is why going to a sanatorium was an attractive option for people. Um, for some people, not everyone wanted it because, especially with tuberculosis, because everyone was sick, you were able to socialize. Not a lot because you're sick, but, you know, at least you were able to have that social interaction. And when recommending uh, what other doctors should do, the uh, eclectic medical doctors said that it's really a matter of weighing risks and benefits, that visitors are good for morale, but too many visitors could wear you out. Um, and so you have to uh, weigh both options. Um, this is from a 1901 eclectic medical journal. We basically went over all of these, but I just thought it was uh, the 10 commandments for the nurse in the sick chamber, not by Moses, but by G.E. Potter, MD from Newark, New Jersey. Um, I'm going to request that all the publications I write for change my byline to that. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, all things that we've talked about before. Um, oh, okay, so sorry, I knew I was running over time. Um, if you like what you hear and you want to hear more, but not about sick rooms and bedrooms, I'm giving a talk at the, or for the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. It's at the First Utilitarian Church in Cincinnati. It is also free this Sunday at five. Um, and I'll be talking more about Catherine Beecher, who I mentioned here, but going into much, much greater detail about her uh, contributions. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone here at the Lloyd. 
um, Patricia and the board of directors, the amazing staff, Erin Campbell gets a gold star, literally, um, because she <laughs> has been kind of my, my person throughout the fellowship, finding materials, um, answering questions. Basically, I, I don't, th I've never had research support of that type with the exception of my mother who was a librarian. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's huge. Um, everybody else was fantastic as well. And um, thank you to Curtis Gates Lloyd for leaving money. Um, here he is saying cheers. <laughs> um, and if you're thinking about applying, the applications are due November 1st, 2023. Um, also, last thank you slide, uh, my two editors at, Sit at Bloomberg City Lab, uh, they are, I'm writing two articles based on my research here that will be published there. Also, thank you to my sister, uh, Victoria, uh, who uh, furnished my sick room, um, <laughs> both here and the one at her home, which I have been staying in um, on and off through the pandemic. Uh, she is amazing at finding vintage uh, and antique items and restoring them. And that's how I got the sick room here. And if you want to stay in touch, Here's all my information. My name is weird. It's easy to find me. Thank you so, so much. We have time for questions. If you like, uh, do you want to take your presentation? Sure. Yeah. Just stop and share. Escape. Yeah. Stop share. Okay. Okay. Oh, we're still recording them. Okay. Sorry, I I know I covered a lot, and it was flying at you at top speed. So yes. I had a question about the void. You yeah. mentioned early that earlier on that you were talking more about void. I know it did come up later. Are you going to be doing more about that? I'm not. There are some people in within Cincinnati who are experts. Um, there's an exhibit at the Museum Center, which I have yet to see, um, where one of his beds are on display. He's more of a character that's come up tangentially for me rather than the focus, but he's absolutely fascinating and um, a great person to have be from Cincinnati. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many people actually use sleep porches? Back to sleep out and that's a good question. Uh, I don't know because it was used, they were built for people who had money and sometimes had sick people or just wanted the luxury of being able to sleep outdoors while living in their year round house rather than their, their summer house. So if you lived here in Cincinnati in Walnut Hills or Hyde Park or probably college, Hill, College Hill, but, um, you'll, you'll see sleeping porches uh, in those neighborhoods as well that weren't necessarily always either ha uh, built where the house was designed with a sleeping porch on it, or a lot of times sleeping porches were added subsequently. So you can kind of tell they look a little rickety because um, they were usually meant to be temporary a hundred years ago, <laughs> but now are sometimes fully functioning enclosed rooms. Um, but I don't have a number. I'm sorry. Yes. My house is a sleeping porch. It was added by my uncle who had tuberculosis. I'm sorry. And the porch was added, and he lived on a sleeping porch. And my family or my grandmother cared for him. So, so that was, and there were many, and this was, was one of the fancy neighborhoods. This was in Latonia. Uh, but they added, they added the porch in the front of the house. It was screened in. So, and after he died, I mean, you know, it, 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 we just used the porch as a porch, but but technically it was also the sick room <laughs> as you described and the sleeping porch. I'm so impressed at how practical all the all the advice is. There's nothing really all that weird. It's it kind of. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I. <laughs> I tried to take as much of a consensus as I could, depending on the the book or the article. There were some more 
left or right or center uh, suggestions, but those seem to be the ones most people agreed on. Um, oh, and I should have pointed out that is obviously not a bed in my fake sick room, <laughs> um, but that is a steamer chair, um, which you frequently found on sleeping porches or cure porches. Um, not to sleep in, but uh, to lounge in during the day. That's why there's a blanket and a fur hat, um, because uh, the fresh air cure was uh, year round. And so you had to bundle up if you were going to be on the porch. Yes. Well, I have a question, and this might not be in your realm of, of study, but but thinking about tuberculosis, and my my grandfather, who would have been born in 1889, so this would have been like a very late um, what was that? I don't know. I've lost her hat for a century. <laughs> you know, and he, in order for him not to get tuberculosis, because he was the youngest in the family, they sent him out to live with somebody in the country, right. not to a sanatorium, mm -hmm. but they sent him to the country. Right. Was yes. this fresh air thing, or was there, he always thought it was to eat milk and eggs. <laughs> yeah. Yes, actually. <laughs> so I think, you know, just, I'm just curious and it's all that you mm -hmm. have also a way to just get somebody out of the, the terrors of the city. Yes. Uh, they lived in over the Rhine. So they Okay, you know, so they were probably had lots of neighbors. Um preve preventatorium or preventatarium is what those establishments were called. Um I know there was at least one here in Cincinnati. Um I, excuse me for interrupting. Oh yes, please. It's Dunham. Um, that it was started in the 18, four, late 1840s originally as a house of pestilence. It was an old <laughs> farmhouse <laughs> and it was there in the country then and they would bring people out so they wouldn't infect anybody else. It eventually became a sanatorium for tuberculosis patients, but it was self-contained. Everything was connected by tunnels. The nurses lived in their own building. Each floor had a sitting room in the center with a fireplace. Oh. So you could entertain a gentleman friend under supervision. Of I course. had a friend whose little sister was That's there, I guess, in the early 50s. And they were only allowed to visit once a month. And when the child would hear their voices, she would bounce up and down in the uh, metal crib. To get to the door. I mean, some of them really bad. That is what was said. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and they, and there, there were sleeping porches on all the buildings, but they had their own farm. They made their own electricity. The doctor lived there. The nurses, everybody lived on site. Where was that? Uh, off Gurley Road. Yeah. Sunset yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and part of it's still there. The Preventorium <laughs> is our rec center. Oh, and interesting. The, um, one of the early Jake's now one of the early men's groups actually built a school for the children in the preventorium. Oh no! Nice. Because they wanted to. What if your mom and dad has tuberculosis? Where are you going to go? Yeah. So they went to the preventorium. Yes. Um, they also, I don't know about the one here specifically, but it was common to have open air classrooms year round at the preventoriums, uh, preventoria, I don't know. Uh, your grandfather also wasn't wrong. I, again, can't speak to the one here, but a lot of the ones uh, to get children out of New York City were in Sullivan County in the Catskills, which is uh, a dairy uh, and farm wonderland. And uh, having children eat a lot of eggs and drink a lot of milk was genuinely part of it because those were fortifying foods and uh you know the, the healthier and stronger you were the more resistant they thought that you know you would be to getting sick so your grandfather was yes <laughs> yes yes colonel schmell got the lw radio in my military career i've been vaccinated so many times I feel like it's ill. <laughs> and when I see the word germ, I must ask, where did that term originate from? That's a really good question. And I do not have the answer to it. Um, I should have looked that up um, and I will when I get home, but I I don't know. I'm really sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry about that. 
but a great question. Yes. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, it was really fascinating. I think like some of you have expressed already, I'm surprised at some of these things that are, or maybe not surprised, but that are still with us, you know, and some things that I've heard or incorporated growing up, and I never knew that was the origin. Like in my family and my grandparents, of course, you always wanted to sleep on the second floor. There was something weird about sleeping on the first floor. But now I know, you know, where that probably came from. So again, really fascinating. The whole thing about fresh air. I know lots of people that still sleep with windows open and that sort of thing. Um, so really a lot of good food for thought. 